I'm going to be honest. This is one of those times that I, I'm, I'm halfway tempted to just take everything I was going to do and toss it aside. I am going to just sh share a few thoughts with you, though. Um, I want to go to Psalm 7, verse 8. It says, Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. And the reason I wanted to, to read this, of course, our Torah portion this week is called Shoftim, which is Judges, uh, you know, one of our favorite topics. Um, judges being judged, judging, those kinds of things. But David prayed that the Lord would judge him according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. And I, I, I say I'm using this scripture because all of our lives, what have we heard? We're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge, and we don't want to be judged, those kinds of things. And yet David prays, judge me, O Lord. It is my view, because I've been one of these people at times, that the people who typically say, don't judge me or you're not supposed to judge, are those whose actions wouldn't stand up under scrutiny. <laughs> they know they're doing wrong, and they don't want to be challenged in that. And again, I was one of those people. When I was doing what I wanted to do, I didn't want anybody to say anything about it, because deep down inside I knew what I was doing was wrong. But David prayed, judge me. There are people who just simply do not want others to tell them what to do. And while I understand that there are certain boundaries that have to be established, the bottom line is this. We need the Father to tell us what to do. And we need Him to judge us at times. You know, it's one thing if a person judges you. And I say that because a person can only go so far. But when God judges you, He's going to get down in <laughs> into the very core of who we are and that, on the surface, can be a very sobering thought, maybe even a bit of a scary thought. But the bottom line is, we want him to judge us because he's always going to do it in, in a righteousness. And he's always going to do it in a way that is for our benefit. You know, there's, there's that episode in the Scripture when David had taken his senses and he was not supposed to do that and there was this plague breaking out and he was given certain options. You can have this, you can have this, you can have this. And the first two he declined because he would have been placed in the hands of men. So he opted to go for the third, which, because I'm going to trust God, I'm going to place my life in his hands. I'm paraphrasing what he said. But what he was reiterating here is I'll let God judge me. Because God is always going to judge me in a righteous way. And so then, the point here is we would do well all of us, to invite a just assessment of our lives. And we know ourselves, but to invite a just assessment of our lives is a good thing. And better yet, to thoroughly consider those things that God, when he judges us or searches our hearts, that we abide by those things. Now, our Torah portion is going to focus on the fact that he told Moses that you're to appoint officers, you know, priests, the kings, the judges, all these things, all these different officers who were given certain uh, duties and responsibilities, which was to kind of bring order and structure. And if it were not needful to do that, if there was no point in that, if it really doesn't serve a purpose, then God wouldn't have done that. He wouldn't have had... Moses appoint judges and other such leaders. If, if it were not needful to have structure and people who uh, were in certain positions, there wouldn't be a book called Judges. And so the idea that, you know, well, don't judge isn't really what Messiah said. He said, be careful how you judge. Because however you judge, that's how you're going to be judged. And so if we are of a mind that we do not be, wish to be judged by God or man, considering that we are in the days of Elul, that's not going to work very well. We need him to search our hearts. I want him to judge me. That doesn't mean I want him to condemn me. I want him to judge me. 
I want him to bring all those things that are not conducive to his purpose and life. I want him to bring those things to, a surf, to the surface so that can be dealt with. This word shoftim, as I said, is uh, alluding to the fact that judges and officers in these kinds of positions are intended to create order. We would assume then that if it's to create order without proper leadership, without judges, without kings, without priests, those kinds of things, there would be chaos. And even if there are judges and leaders, it's really important that they're righteous and they're judging righteously and justly. Because either way, if it's not done the Father's way, there will be chaos. It is my opinion, if I look out my window and I look at the news, which I don't do, but just kind of observe what's going on, um, I don't see order. I see chaos. And it's because godly structure, boundaries, these kinds of things have been long abandoned. We do not want that chaos that's out there coming in here. We do not want the chaos that's out there coming into our homes, do we? So there has to be that order. There has to be that instruction. There has to be that structure. We have to be a people who have a mind to allow the Father to search our hearts, to judge, and to bring to, surf, to the surface those things that need to be dealt with. Because the God of Israel is a God of, of order. He's not the author of confusion and chaos. So it seems to me to refuse judgment, to shy away from inviting God to search our hearts, to refuse the way he set up structure among his people is a way to invite chaos. There are a lot of families that are busy, and in that busyness there can be hectic times, but there's a difference between hectic and chaotic. And so I wanted to say that before I said this. I've met people and I've met families, and I'm sure you have too, that their life is chaos. It's just no structure, no order. That's not the way it's supposed to be in God's family. Now, I know that some feel like they can manage the chaos, and perhaps for a little while they can, but eventually that chaos is going to overtake. And so there needs to be structure and order, and that's one of the reasons... God established certain boundaries, appointed officers, leaders, those kinds of things to cultivate a just order. In other words, proper leadership is used to preclude that chaos, to preclude and to avoid mob rule. You know what another word for mob rule is? Democracy. By the way, this is not a democracy. <laughs> yeah, we're, th no. This congregation is not a democracy, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip some things here. It's, it's not critical to what I want to share with you this morning. But the standards that we can read in the Torah portion that are expected of judges and leaders, I believe should be expected of all of God's people not just for people in position. Now, I understand that leaders, whatever position they are in, are held to a high standard. Teachers are held to a very high standard. But my point is, I believe that all of God's people should learn and live by these standards and these principles that are expected of the judges and the leaders that he talks about in Scripture here. In other words, here's what I'm getting at. All God's people should be leaders in training because all of us are going to be put in a position to influence someone, and we need to be able to lead. We need to be able to discern. We need to be able to render judgment righteously and justly based on truth. And so it all matters, you and I, every one of us. We need to be people who can judge things justly with integrity and with an understanding of the truth and not just based on how I feel and what my opinion is. In fact, I think the Scripture in this Torah portion implies that we all need to be equipped 
to work things out in a just manner. Deuteronomy 17, verse 8. If a matter arises which is too hard for you to judge, between degrees of guilt for bloodshed, between one judgment or another, or between one punishment or another, matters of controversy within your gates, then you shall arise and go up to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall come to the priests, the Levites, and to the judge there in those days, and inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. You shall do according to the sentence which they pronounce upon you in the place which the Lord chooses, and you shall be careful to do according to all that they order you, according to the sentence of the law, in which they instruct you according to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. And you shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. And so there is a very clear message there that those that he appoints to be priests and judges, etc., and different officers, in certain matters, if they render a judgment, it is our responsibility to go by that and to stay true to it. But I want you to notice something else that really doesn't jump out as quickly as that, the, there's a hint here that there are some issues that you and I should be able to work out among us without going to a judge. Because he says, if there is something too hard for you to judge, well, what does that imply? Everything shouldn't be too hard for you to judge. Which goes back to my statement, I think that all of us, all of God's people, whether we're in some official capacity or not, need to live by these standards and these principles that he assigns to those who are going to be leading and governing and judging, etc. Because again, there are matters that shouldn't be too hard for you and I to figure out based on what the Word says. There are some things, this just... Bible 101, and yet, <laughs> dot, 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 mm -hmm. we need to be people who are able to discern between right and wrong. And here's where we get in trouble, everyone, you, me, all of us. We let emotions get involved. We let opinions get involved. We let relationships get involved. And all of those things have the ability to warp our sense of justice based on what the Scripture is. Because you will see that anyone who's put in any kind of position is not to be swayed by politics or finance or relational issues. It's what God says, this is right, and what God says, this is wrong. And that's how you're to render judgment. So again, what I'm saying is that goes for all of us. And there are certain situations that are going to arise in our lives that we have to be able to discern right from wrong based on the word and then to be willing to resolve those kinds of things amongst ourselves. In other words, we don't need to be people who can't make a decision and resolve a conflict without going to somebody else. I understand that there are times we have to. I get it. But do you hear what I'm saying? We need to be the kind of people who can discern right from wrong and have the wherewithal to resolve conflict amongst ourselves. Sometimes I think we have this need to vent. Sometimes we might be even a little tempted to tattle. But that's not what we really need to be focused on. We need to be focused on how can we, there are things that we need to be able to resolve. Now, he makes it clear that there are matters that are too hard for some to judge. The things that are outside of our scope of understanding, some things that we don't have the authority to, to determine or to decide. And those are the issues that we take to the appropriate officer and leader. But it shouldn't be that every matter is too hard for us to judge. 1 Corinthians 6, if any of you has a dispute, dispute with one another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Don't you know that we'll judge angels? How much more the things of this life? 
Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to the court, and this in front of unbelievers. Well, he's kind of scolding them. But the point that I wanted to make here is, if it is intended that we are to be placed in position to judge the world, why are we unwilling or unable to judge simple matters? And I'm, I'm saying that in general. I'm not saying that there's anything in our congregation that this is specific to. This is just part of this whole idea of learning how to be people who can rightly divide the word of truth, to make judgment in certain situations. And yes, even resolve conflict. Because what Paul's saying is, you're embarrassing our Heavenly Father by taking all your junk before a world that doesn't agree with him in the first place. Why in the world would you do something like that? What kind of example are you presenting to the world? Because his intention for us is that we are to judge we're here to rule and to reign with him. And so I guess my point is he gives us practice here. He gives us opportunity for practice. He gives us opportunity to train, to learn. Because there is an expectation that you and I should be able to resolve conflict. Well, I don't feel qualified to judge certain matters. Oh, okay, that's fine. I get it. I'm there too. But if I don't feel qualified to do something right now and yet... I see what he has intended for me, and this goes for you too. We might want to check in to see in how we learn these things and to grow and to mature. If we don't try to understand the scripture and attain the wisdom that comes from the scripture, life is going to be really tough. There's that old saying, I think it's John Wayne says, you know, life is tough, but it's tougher when you're stupid. Well, there's a lot of profound wisdom in that. We shouldn't just rely on somebody else. Somebody else will take care of it. We need to learn these things for ourselves. And the, the Father will put us in situations that will help us to learn these things. Because issues are going to arise in our life that's going to require us to judge between right and wrong. And so we need to mature to the point that we can make righteous judgment. And again, not based on how I feel. Because my feelings will lie to me. Not based on my opinion, because my opinion is usually based on how I feel. <laughs> A lot of times anyway, right? But we need to make, be able to make decisions based on what is written. Now, I, I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying, okay, everybody just start judging everybody. That is not what I'm saying. That is not what I'm saying. But I'm saying everybody learn how to judge righteously justly according to the word and i would also add this with the temperance that we see our heavenly father demonstrate when he does search our hearts and judge our lives we i feel we saw a demonstration of that this morning here we are all of us i know i'm not the only one who was a certain way long ago I'm looking at a room full of people. I don't know there's more out there. Every one of us can remember a time that we were in a place we knew we shouldn't be there. Doing things we knew we shouldn't be doing. And he spoke to us. He got our attention. And he didn't beat me over the head with my sin. He said, you know you're not supposed to be doing this. And he forgave me. He judged me. He was searching my heart and he was exposing what was in my heart. But he tempered it with compassion. That's important as well. So I don't want you to think I'm telling you I want you to go out and start judging everybody. I'm not. I'm wanting us all to learn how to be righteous judges in terms of being able to help the overall health of this community, to be able to discern between good and evil, to be able to discern what is the best path to resolve this issue or to address that 
particular goings on. Yeah, there are going to be things that arise that's beyond our understanding or it's beyond our authority to take action. And yes, in those situations, we take those issues to those who are duly appointed to render a decision. But let me say this. This is something we all need to learn too, myself included. If I feel like something is beyond my scope of understanding or I just simply don't have the authority to address a certain situation and I need to take it to somebody over me and the Lord, then I also need to be prepared that whatever they say, I'm good to go with it. <laughs> I mean, so that's what we read, right? So in other words, if I'm a, I need some help and I need you to help me with this and this is something really too difficult for me and I need your guidance and your wisdom and your assistance in this and to, to render a decision here and then they render a decision, I've got to be the kind of person that says, okay, I'm going to go with your decision because that's what we just read. In other words, if you come to me or other leadership in the congregation, there's a situation that's too hard for you or what have you, and you say, I need you to you know, speak into this, and I say, well, X, Y, Z. And then you go A, B, C. We're not going to be talking about these things anymore. You understand what I'm saying? We have to be people who, if we're going to allow ourselves to be judged and searched and, and open ourselves up to be vulnerable in that way that we need someone to speak into our lives, then we need to be willing to receive what they have to say. Amen? That's what the Torah says. Now, that idea triggers some people because there are people who don't want to be told what to do. Well, remember, there are people who don't want to be judged, <laughs> which is people who are likely to invite chaos into their life. It's very clear in Scripture that those who have been placed in positions of authority when making a decision in a matter, their judgment should be respected. Now, I don't want anybody to think I'm saying this because I'm on some power trip I'm really not interested in getting too involved in your business. I promise you I'm not. I've got enough business of my own to deal with. And, and it, so I don't want anybody to think, well, he's just saying that because, he, you know, he's a, uh, the kind of guy, he just wants us to do everything he says. No, I, that's not my thing. That's not. However, if we do... If we are going to be a people of order and structure, according to what Scripture says, there is a certain way that God has established things. And we need to be the kind of people that would allow those over us in the Lord, myself included, to speak into our life and it be received and not be quick, quickly rejected. But what if those judges are wrong? What if that pastor is wrong? What if that leader is wrong? Or what if it's just that you think they're wrong? Ideally, those people who are over us in the Lord are to render judgment according to God's standards of justice, of course. But there's rabbinical commentary suggests that even if they are wrong, that you're supposed to do what they say. Oh, no, I, how, how can we do that? Listen to what Yeshua said, Matthew 23, verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they've been given authority. They sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In other words, obey their judgments even if they're not doing the right thing in their own life. Do what's right even if they're not doing what's right. Let your righteousness exceed their righteousness. You do what's right before the Father in heaven. He'll take care of them later. But just because somebody else does the wrong thing is not licensed for us to go do the wrong thing. Right? Well, just because they said that, then that gives me license to say this. No. We don't do that. We have to respect the structure and the order that the Creator has established, or else in time there will be chaos. So we need to be the kind of people, as we allow God to search our hearts and judge us, as it were, we need to be the kind of people that will adhere to instruction and do the right thing regardless of what everybody else is doing. If there's a breakdown in order and structure, then what's going to happen is chaos, as I said. And in rabbinical literature, they say it's that the Torah is fragmented into many Torahs. And what they mean by that is 
if there's no structure, if there's no order, if there's no adherence to the structure, then everybody's just doing whatever they want to do. And that's why we have 30,000 plus denominations, I think. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe that's why we have a lot of different quote unquote messianic groups and organizations that, you know, and, uh, you know, because you can get into things like, uh, theoretically speaking, uh, you know, sacred name congregations and calendar congregations and which calendar congregation, you know, all those kinds of things. In other words, great division among the people. And why? Because nobody can tell me what to do. I'm not going to listen to anybody. There is wisdom and following decisions of those who are given authority. I know that there are people who question my way of doing things sometimes. I live with one of those people. <laughs> and she has a way of, no. There is wisdom in following the decisions of those that God has placed in authority. And if they're wrong, then God will take care of them. He'll deal with them. But in the meantime, our righteousness needs to exceed their righteousness if they are doing wrong. We need to do the right thing regardless. And I know that's a hard pill for some to swallow, but that's what the Scripture teaches us to do. The mini Torahs concept does not work. Everybody just doing whatever they want to do does not work. Because everybody's going to be going off in different directions. And one of these days, while we're going off in different directions, some stuff's going to happen. This world's going to be turned on its ear. And then all these people who are going off in all these different directions are going to wonder what to do. There needs to be stability. There needs to be godly structure, righteous judgment. This mini Torahs thing doesn't work because in the end, even when we have differences of opinion, God has established it that there are people, officers, leaders, that he compels to make decisions. And so you and I, when we're under those people, we're just going to have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And he raises up people that he trusts. I believe that it's obvious that God trains and he raises up people to be in certain positions of authority. And an important element of that training is for all of us to understand his standards of justice. You know, as I said earlier, I didn't always do this. Forty years ago, I was doing a lot of other things. And I had no idea about this kind of thing. Wasn't anywhere near ready. And notice he didn't just take me from one place and put me in this one. It was a long, drawn-out process and a lot of things to learn, a lot of experiences to go through. And that, that's not just me. That's all of us. So he trains us. He puts us in certain situations. And, and then he raises up people that learn in those certain situations what to do, how to do in a right way. And then he puts them in positions of authority. So again, it's very important for us all to recognize that we all have to be trained in how to be a righteous judge, as it were. And we have to understand his standards of justice, as opposed to what we think is just, as opposed to what our opinion is and how we feel. But I also want you to hear this. If he trains us, and he does, how does it look, or what does it look like? To me, it seems very clear that he puts us in, he gives us smaller things to manage to see if we're going to be faithful in those little things. Moses was out in the wilderness, how long? 40 years before God let him lead two to three million people. He gives us these smaller things to manage to see, okay, are they going to gonna be faithful in this? Are they going to continue on? And particularly when it gets hard and when it gets tough and they don't want to do it, he gives us those smaller things to manage to see if we're going to be faithful. And I think that this is a prerequisite before he puts us in any kind of position over larger things. I just, I, that just makes sense to me. 
So it's very important to our growth, to our, to our becoming the people that he can put in this situation or that situation to render righteous judgment for God's people. It's important for us to embrace the responsibility that he gives right now, today, as he gives it to us. Don't shirk the responsibility to handle the smaller matters. At the same time, it's very important that we do not try to be those guys that move to the front of the line. There are people who are not content to walk out the smaller things. They... Uh, there are people who feel that their current tasks are beneath, are beneath their talents. I'm far more talented for this. Why does God have me doing this? Well, really, you just explain why God has, has you doing this. <laughs> he wants to see, are you willing to do this little thing for me and to be faithful in that? Sometimes we can get impatient. And impatient people tend to falter either because of timing or their pride or whatever. I guess what I'm trying to say is let's don't rush into things. We let, we let God lead us in this. So good judgment, rendering righteous judgment, begins with being able and being willing to judge ourselves, to tell ourselves no, to discern our own heart, to invite God to search it. Let me... If I feel that the Father has called me to do this, and yet I am, he's got me doing this, I need to be careful not to give in to our emotions and opinions. I need him to search my heart and, okay, what is it? Why am I still doing this? Why am I still here? Why is this still going on? Whatever it is. And be able to discern our own hearts. And if we, are, if we allow him to work, we, he'll probably show us, well, this is because you need to work on this. Or you need to address that. So good judgment begins with being able and being willing to judge ourselves. How do we expect to judge the nations if we can't judge our own, you know, self? How do we expect to overcome the adversary without if we haven't learned to overcome the adversary within? Good judgment also means refraining from rushing into a situation or a decision. I say it kind of tongue-in-cheek a lot, but there are many times when I've stood up here and I felt like I, I was going to say something, I thought, whoa, I need to stop. I need to pause, and I need to measure my words. I need to think carefully about what I'm going to say because some people are going to take my word as something official, <laughs> and I need to be very careful about that. So we don't need to rush into things. We don't need to rush to judgment, as they say. We, and that that goes... You know, just dealing with our own personal lives. We don't need to rush into things. We need to, to be willing to stop and pause and say, what is it you want to do? Now, I'm saying that, thinking now about what happened this morning, and you must believe me, what happened this morning, I didn't walk in here with that intended. I just felt like the Father was doing something, and just we needed to hold on and wait and see what he wanted to do. In other words, we need to be able to discern what he's doing, what he's saying. And if he's saying go, we go. If he's saying wait, we wait. You understand? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at here. If we're going to be judging the world, <laughs> we need to be able to judge things right here and now. We need to learn to listen to his voice. And we need to be very faithful to learn and grow in the small matters. And if we do that, he will enlarge, which brings us to the last point I'm going to get into today. Deuteronomy 19, verse 8 and 9. Now, if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he swore to your fathers and gives you the land which he promised to give to your fathers, and if you keep all these commandments and do them, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to walk always in his ways, then you shall add three more cities for yourself besides the three. In other words, the issues being discussed are the cities of refuge. But I'm going to emphasize that word if. He says, if the Lord enlarges your territory 
as if to say, if you are faithful in what he's given you to do today, then he'll enlarge your territory for tomorrow. If you're committed today, then you will realize the fruition of other certain promises. In other words, it's possible that one may not realize the entirety of what we've been promised because we don't take the time to stop and listen and judge and let him search our hearts and, you know, and, and learn to be faithful in what he's given us to do today, to make a judgment in that regard. I guess what I'm trying to get across today is this whole tour portion about Shoftim judges. It is our tendency, I think, to focus on, well, judges, they judge this, they judge that, and they need to be this kind of a person. We all need to be those kinds of people. Because every day we're going to have to make judgments in our own lives. And we need to be able to make those judgments according to his standards and his principles and his precepts and his concepts and not just on our opinion. So apparently, it seems anyhow, that whether we realize certain promises is up to how we act and what we do. And I would suggest that if we resist the structure and order that God has established, those things might be in peril. If we do not allow ourselves to be challenged by his word, will some of these things come to pass? If we can't handle the little things, how should we expect that he would think we can handle the big things? Jeremiah 12, verse 5, if the footmen are wearing you out, how are you going to contend with horses? Now, I've always understood that passage to, to at least be hinting if you're getting worn out when everything's relatively okay, what in the world are you going to do when things are turned upside down? Let me put it this way. If we can't handle little matters within our families and congregations today, what in the world are we going to do when the four horsemen start riding? So he gives us opportunity today to be faithful in little things to understand his precepts and principles and not be, not always be guided and led along by our emotions and opinions. But to be guided by what is written. So I want us to see that this portion, it teaches about God's structure of leadership and how when we do things his way, chaos is avoided. And if there's no chaos, that means there's order. And if there's order, hopefully there's peace. There is shalom. I want shalom. <laughs> I, I want shalom. All right? I want wholeness. Right? Well, it doesn't just drop into our lap. He's given us some standards that we should employ in our lives. And not just focus on the leaders. Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. There has to be leaders. And yes, those men and women need to be people of integrity. They need to be truthful. They need to be people who abide by his word. But guess what? Those people he puts in those positions used to be sitting out in those seats. And so that means those people sitting out in the seats, they need to be guided by these principles too because there might be something the Father has for you where he's going to put you in a position to lead and offer structure and instruction to others. And so we want to learn that his way, when we do things his way, chaos is avoided. And as I said, hopefully there can be shalom. But I also want us to see that we're all leaders in training. And so we need to be appropriating these principles in our life right now. I dare say that when Moses appointed judges and officers and all those people, uh, he didn't just go one potato, two potato, three potato, four. I doubt it. He knew, he recognized men of integrity, which was, is to say people who have in times past shown themselves to be capable of doing things in a righteous and a just manner because they had the experience to, to do that. So we, we believe that God is a purpose for all of us, but we also believe that whether we see the fruition of it will depend at least in part on how we respond to his leading. 
It'll depend at least in part on how we act and whether we're willing to rise to the challenge that is before us because it's not just going to happen because we want it to happen. As I was sharing Thursday night, I think it was, he says, I'm with you. This is what I want you to do. Now do the work. There's things that we have to do. So we should consider what's required of us if we're going to see the fruition of his purpose in our life. And for certain, if that's going to happen, we cannot be of the mindset, don't judge me. To the contrary, we need to be the kind of people who say, judge me, O Lord. Search my heart. Make ourselves vulnerable. David said this in Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and you've known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. That's vulnerability. That's just making ourselves, laying ourselves bare before the Father. Search me. There's other passages where he's invited to remove any unclean thing, anything that's corrupt. Scour me with hyssop and I'll be made clean. He wants our inner parts to be clean and pure. So to make our souls vulnerable to him, to invite him to judge us, to be willing to be searched out, it seems to me it requires a great deal of humility and a certain degree of courage. I mean, there are, you think about what I'm saying. Judge me, O oh God. We're inviting the creator of the universe to judge us. And the scary part of that is we know us. Right? But we have to be of that heart. Judge us. Search us out. Search out everything. And so again, that requires humility and a bit of courage or maybe the word would be better rendered confidence that in inviting God to do this, we know that he will search us out and it will render what is in our best interest, what is good for us, what is good for our family. But that, I believe, is going to be required of us if we are going to continue to develop in our walk and, and be able to be the people who function in the purpose that he has designed for us. Then that means this. It will not be for the faint of heart Everything God has called you and me to be, families, congregation, is not going to be for the faint of heart. I think we're, we've, already, we've already seen that. We've already experienced that in our lives, in this congregation's life. We've already experienced it's not going to be for the faint of heart. It's going to take some courage, determination, and it's going to take some grit and faithfulness just to continue going, doing, even when it gets tough, because we believe that God has called us to be a peculiar people, right? Amen? Amen? Is that right? So it's not going to be for the faint of heart. And that's going to be very important for us to remember as we continue going forward as a congregation. Because in our Torah portion, we read that when you're going forth into battle, there are certain people that need to be considered that may, they may not be, need to be here. You know, if you grew a vineyard, but you haven't eaten of the vineyard. If you bought a house, but you hadn't dedicated it. If you're betrothed, but you haven't taken your, you know, those kinds of things. But then he says, but now, for those who are fearful and faint-hearted, they need to go back home. Now, who's being considered here? The fearful or the courageous? God didn't want the faint-hearted in the battle lest they influence others to be as they were because their fear would potentially infect others and potentially affect the outcome of the battle. I would even say that fear on the battlefield has the potential to create chaos on the battlefield. All you soldiers, would that be correct? So on the battlefield, there needs not to be chaos, there needs to be order, there needs to be structure, and there needs to be adherence to those instructions given by those who are over you. Is that true, gentlemen, ladies? Or else you have chaos. And when you have chaos, that can affect negatively the outcome of the battle. So you hear what I'm saying? All these principles 
are for all of us. Now, these people were not shamed, nor were they humiliated. It's just that they did not participate. Go home. In that regard, they were shown mercy. But that mercy shown to them was also mercy and consideration for those who were going into the battle. I think it's more about the people who were prepared to go to battle than it was for those who were going home. But it's also possible that in time, those people who had to go home from that battle would be inspired by those they saw go into the battle and who lived to tell about it and to strengthen and bolster their confidence that when God says, I go before you, he really means it, right? So even in that, we have to learn how to judge and how to discern. When everything is all said and done today, here's the, the, the essence of my message is in these words of Paul, who says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Now, he's talking about a lot of different matters that are going on in that congregation, but what I want us to really get here is He's saying that there's a lot of things that you and I are subjected to that we would not have to be subjected to if we would just learn to apply these principles of righteous judgment to our own lives first and foremost. If we would do that, then a lot of good things would emanate from that. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord. And he chastens those he loves, right? And why does he chasten us? That we may not be condemned with the world. So it seems to me that judgment is a good thing. This whole idea of don't judge me, it's a silly approach to life. You don't judge me. I'm not going to be judged. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. Well, Unfortunately, sometimes, sometimes that expression is not just intended for people. It's intended for him too. We want to be the kind of people that invite him to judge us. We want to be the kind of people who stop and judge ourselves first. Because if we embrace God's standards of justice and structure in our own life, perhaps we're not going to be prone to kick at it in other ways. If we are judged because we were wrong in a particular matter, what does he intend? To provoke us to do the right thing, to learn, to grow. And I'll, I'll just close with this. I'd rather be judged than condemned. I'd rather him judge me than to have to stand before him and hear him say, depart from me, I don't know you. So I want to be judged. I want to be judged by his righteousness. I want to be judged according to his justice. And when I'm wrong, I want him to reprove me. I want him to correct me because I do not want to be condemned. Amen? You know, I'm, I'm still of the, the sense Well, I don't think the Father's quite done with what he wants to do today. And I'm not going to conjure anything or, you know, try to make something happen that's not happening. I'm just going to just appeal to all of us here today and all of you who are watching that whatever he's initiated in our spirit this morning, don't let that just dissipate. You know, whatever he put in your heart, that he was speaking to your heart and your spirit this morning, don't let that just go away now that we've had, you know, a message and we're getting ready to go to Oneg. Don't, don't get too wrapped up into those things that we dismiss what we feel like he planted in our heart and spirit this morning. Am I making sense to you? Because maybe... Maybe that's part of him kind of searching us right now. I know that's what was happening to me. Let's let's not be quick 
to just turn the page and we're on to something else. Okay? Can we do that?